Okay, first, thanks to the organizers for putting together this great session and for letting me share my work. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I wasn't able to get that to go. I think, I think you could just use the arrow key on the keypad. Okay. Ibidation or admixture is the subject of a growing interest in the human evolution research agenda. And since the publication of the Neanderthal genome, uh, many events of admixture have been brought to life, but they have been documented just from the analysis of remains for four different sites, which make us anticipate that the best from this uh, research field is yet to come. What can we know about these processes? Well, from a DNA uh, analysis, we can know what this event uh, affected the genetic pool of past individuals of present-day populations. More concretely, we can learn about admixture uh, rates, approximate time of introgression, or the transmission of certain genes. However, many uh, specific questions about this process remain unanswered. Uh, was, it a, was there a cultural mechanism preventing hybridation? Was it an isolated event or a common practice? And if it was a common practice, what, how is it that it left so little trace in present day populations? But before giving an answer to these concrete questions, we should, or we think that we should start by the basics. There are many parameters that are known to have an effect on unmixture processes. Uh, biology, demography, environmental, culture, since we are talking about human groups, and geography, and we also know that they influence each other at different levels. Uh, this time we are going to talk about geography, and in this model we understand geography as the spatial arrangement of population and its mobility. Uh, this interest of ours for the spatial dimension of admixture uh, processes came to us from a uh, previous work. We uh, recently published a paper called Biocultural Interactions uh, during the transition from Middle to Upper Paleolithic uh, transition in Iberia. And while we were analyzing this, this, the simulation outcomes from this model, we realized that um, spatial arrangement, arrangement had a higher effect that we would expect. So we decided that before we, we move forward into um, implementing new parameters into this model, we will focus on characterizing the spatial arrange arrangement effect. This is the work that we are still working on and that we are here to present. The model that we are using is an adaptation of the model we used from the previous work, who was in turn an adaptation of the model Human Ecodynamics by Barton and Real Sabato. <coughs> Once adapted, the model is initialized with two different groups of individual agents, each of whom is almost homozygous at M or N at its same loci. Each locus uh, well, the two populations can be initialized mixed or geographically segregated, and the number of agents at each group is chosen by the researcher. The frequency of M alleles in each of the agent's genomes determines the genotypic group they belong to. And groups one and eight are the pure initial genotypic groups, and between them there's a whole range of genotypic variability that is divided into six other groups. All agents reproduce at the same rate, and when an agent is to reproduce, the simulation checks if, they, if there is another agent within the agent. Ooh. Let's go. No. Let's go in by itself. It checks if there's another agent. If there is not, the agent clones itself. And the, if there are other agents, one is chosen at random, and then they mate. Then a genotypic independent, independent assortment written creates the offspring uh, genome from the combination of that of its parents. The new individual is, is then placed in a distance that is bigger of that of its parents' uh, 
home range. Agents also die all at the same rate. Okay. To begin with, we've uh, explored the range of variability between two parameters. The first is proportion. That means the number of agents of each of the two groups in comparison to the others. We explored three scenarios, highly unbalanced, unbalanced and even proportion. The second parameter is distribution, uh, is the placement of agents with, within the uh, interaction area. We have two scenarios here, mixed, agents of the two groups are randomly distributed through the whole scenario and segregated. Agents from each of the group are randomly distributed within a determined area, creating a frontier between, between them. When analyzing the results outcomes, we are looking at three things. Population composition, that means the final size of each of the genotypic groups. We've constructed box plots to easily compare the size of each group and also to compare one scenario to the other. And also we've drawn uh, kruskal wallis test to check whether if the differences we observed were statistically relevant or not. We're also looking at neighbor di diversity, that the frequency of genotypically equal neighbors in an agent's home range. And we are looking also to temporal evolution, that's the di diachronic changes in the genotypic group's relative, relative size. Uh, we've put together a little summary of the results we have so far. First is population composition. Here we can see that in the highly, well, for the mixed uh, distribution scenarios. Here we can see that in the highly unbalanced uh, proportion scenarios, the most numerous uh, group is number seven, followed by uh, groups number six and eight, which is totally logic if we have, if we take into con consideration that uh, at the beginning of the simulation, group number eight was much, much bigger than group number one. If we go uh, to, the, um, to those scenarios with a more equilibrated uh, group size, we see that agents tend to concentrate in those groups at the center of the, of the genotypic range, what, what means that we have a more heterogenic population. When we look at uh, temporal evolution, we see that in the highly imbalanced proportion, um, scenarios, we don't see the temporal evolution of genotypic group one because it's so uh, small that it disappears by the beginning of the simulation. Then we observe group eight that uh, describes a, a very punctuated growth followed by a, a descent of the number of agents that it is stepped with the growth of genotypic group seven. In the other two scenarios, what we see is a fairly similar pattern that is characterized by the uh, decrease in the number of agents of group seven and eight. And then that is followed by the growth and stabilization of the other groups. This growth and stabilization follows a, a established pattern. First is group number seven and two, those who grow, then six and three. That means that we have, as we see in the com population composition, a way through heterogeneity. In the segregated scenarios, it's quite easy to see that there's a, a, differences, a difference uh, when we compare them to the mixed scenarios. Highly unbalanced proportion scenarios, population composition, uh, we can see that number, uh, group number seven is still the biggest group, but number, groups number two, three, and four have a uh, relevant size this time. With, with the scenarios with an even proportion, we see that groups two and seven are the most, uh, or the bigger groups. The same happens with, uh, with the scenarios with a only small unbalancement. And we also see changes in the temporal evolution. Here we can observe a, a growth of uh, genotypic group one. Uh, the behavior of genotypic group eight is the same as it is this genotypic group 
uh, seven. But here we see how uh, the other groups start to grow and stabilize at the first third of the simulation. Those scenarios with a more equilibrated proportion of agents describe fairly similar pattern. We see a, a really punctuated growth of groups seven and eight, followed by, by uh, the sense in the number of agents that is stepped with the growth of uh, groups two and seven. This is uh, in the first, in the first, in the previous slide, we saw that the results were a, pro a direct product of the initial population sizes. But here, we see that the distribution of agents in two different parts of the uh, interaction area had an effect. That is, that it allowed the smaller population at the beginning of the simulation to grow a little before it enters in contact with the other, sim uh, with the other population and they start admixture. That's why we have, uh, that's why at the end of the simulation we have a more heterogeneous population. We've also started to conduct the neighbor div diversity uh, analysis. In this case, what we are going, well, what we want to look at is to find and characterize if there is any uh, relation between local and global variability. Uh, local variability is the variability within an agent's home range and global variability is what we've been calling population composition. In order to do this, we've uh, conducted correlation analysis and we, what we've seen so to now is that there are some cases in which there is a positive correlation and this correlation is significant but there are other cases, other scenarios, where there is no correlation at all. Uh, we still have to conduct more analysis and go through all the scenarios to give an, an explanation to this. Well, and what we've learned so far, even though we are in the middle of the outcome analysis, we can already say that the spatial distribution of the population has an effect on the uh, process and the outcome of an ad admixture um, process. In the cases what, that we have presented now, uh, both final population composition and temporal evolution have a very predictable behavior. What it is good for us, because this is just the, the first stage of a more bigger um, project we have. So now when we introduce new uh, variables, we know how the, how the model behaves until now and it's easier to trace the effect of the new parameters. For the analysis we have to do, we have to do longer simulation because as you could see, there are some simulations that are not completely stabilized. We have to complete the neighbor diversity analysis and to do the analysis on home range sizes. The, as I've said, the ultimate goal was not this outcome, those outcomes. The ultimate goal is to get to know better our knowledge in order to implement new parameters and to get a new big and marvelous model called Peninsula Ibérica. And that's all. Thank you very much.